be real. And we'll see if those particular cards end up popping up in the hands of either of our players. You can see both of them look calm, cool, and collected as we head into the match here. Land go here from use the same thing from Javier as he passes his turn back. Cards to look at here in the early stages. You see a Cultivate sitting down there for Yuza. That's one that he'll he'll be happy to uh, to get fired off here on turn three. Yeah, you love to see it. Cultivate is a nice one in this matchup. Get yourself a little bit of fixing and a mana advantage. So not unhappy to see that if you're either player. Again, what's so weird about this deck is you're watching it kind of play the games, especially in the mirrors. You know, you'll, you might see some players just crank out into a ton of mana and then haven't found their payoff yet. So, yeah, they've got this huge mana advantage, but they're not really utilizing it the way they'd want to be all the time. Not like you're going to mulligan a hand with Cultivate to fix your mana and accelerate you, but it's not the end all be all if it does resolve. Right. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's going to resolve. Martin, of course, needs to keep in mind his uh, emergent ultimatum mana requirements, triple green, double blue, double black. He, so he just needs to make sure that he's able to do that uh, by the time he gets to seven mana so that he can have the, at least the option on firing that off as soon as possible. On the other side, it's a similar card. It's it's smoothing there on two turns there, Omen of the Sea for Javier Dominguez. Now he doesn't have Cultivate. He's just going to play a land and ship it back. Got a little bit of an expensive hand going here, but he does have double mystical dispute and another Omen to kind of protect him. Speaking of the Omen, now it's yeah. time to get a little looking going on here for Javier. Both these players, I, I could watch play kind of forever, if I'm being honest. Uh, they're both expressive. They both play incredibly, incredibly tight magic. And the other thing I do like about both of them is they like to get aggressive. So I'm a little bit saddened that they've gone the ultimatum route. But with so much on the line and the aggressive decks not being uh, the best of the bunch in this particular standard format, I get the decision. Yeah, where's where's the... Uh... Where's the Ember Cleaves and stuff? You know, come yeah, on. No Cleaves, no, no real faceless Haven showing up this right. weekend either. It's a little bit disappointing, I must say. But no snow covered anything here. It's the reality of the situation, for better or worse. Yeah, it is, and uh, and you can tell that if both of these players decided to go this route, that there really wasn't a, a better option on the aggressive end of the spectrum. Um, right now question is is really about mana martin uses significantly ahead on mana he's on six lands now versus just four here for javier um and critically javier starting to get a little low on lands he's got the next land drop lined up but he may see him start to look at, at cracking for some scries here he does need to get things going and we get a little bit of a feeler spell here for martin he's going to fire off just a yorian into an otherwise empty board sure well it's going to get countered by mystical dispute not the end all be all but yeah, just trying to get a little something going. Uh, that's the other thing that's a little bit peculiar about this matchup sometimes is just that, you know, you do want to get a creature kind of on the battlefield as opposed to this draw go nonsense to be able to force your opponent's hand into a draw disruption, into a disdainful stroke, something like that. That plan did not work out. So we play with empty battlefields, at least for right now. Yeah, Martin Yuza is definitely aware of Juari Disruption uh, as a possibility here from Javier. He played five of his six mana last turn. Martin, really well known for figuring out what the opponent's up to and then also following through with playing around it. Um, you know, it's almost like his reputation in the pro community that he'll play around uh, pretty much anything that he can. But look at this. Seagate Restoration goes on the stack. But he can be happy about this. That drew another mystical dispute. If it resolved, he would have been in an absolutely commanding position. But now he's lined himself up for Emergent Ultimatum, having burned through two copies of his opponent's uh, counterspell there. Yeah, and you know, that's that's one of the nice things, too, is that you do present enough threats that are powerful that at some point, you know, if you're able to go, hey, see to get your restoration, other thing that you have to counter, it's like, okay, well, I've got the Emergent Ultimatum, too, so I'm going to try to cast this and resolve it. And we know, as we talked about at the top, if this one does resolve, it's not lights out all of the time, but it is a high percentage of the time. Right, it's the, it's the single most impactful thing that you can do. And guess what just happened? Javier Dominguez... He just opened the door and said, come on in, buddy. I haven't seen you forever. Tapped out completely as he passes the turn back. And Martin says, cool, I don't have to play around anything. I can go Epiphany into Ultimatum. I can do it the other way around. And it looks like he's going to go ahead and fire off Alrun's Epiphany. And uh, and then he can go for an Ultimatum as well. Looks like he's deciding on if he should play Draw Disruption as a land, the Draw Isle. If he does, he could go land and have Mystical dis or um, Disdainful Stroke, excuse me, available the next turn, but he's decided against it. He's going to go for the Emergent Ultimatum here. It goes on the stack, 
And this is going to make life extraordinarily difficult for one Javier Dominguez. He didn't feel like he had a choice with his hand. If you look at it at Javier's hand, it's pretty bad. It's five drops, six drops, seven drops, seven drop. And then he's got some reactive stuff, right? The uh, extinction event. And then, you know, sure, a wolf willow haven down there and a land. That's just not a proactive hand enough for him, given the amount that he only has five lands right now. So he yeah. just needed to do something. And unfortunately for him, Martin was far from re being out of gas in this in this particular instance. No, Martin had, uh, I don't want to say it all, but pretty darn close to it. Really, really, really good draw here for Juza in this particular game. Uh, yeah, for Javier, I mean, he got to... Sorry to interrupt. He, oh, he got good. to use uh, Seagate Restoration as like a feeler spell there. I mean, that's... A little bait spell. Yeah. A little bait spell. That's kind of uh, where you want to be. Yeah, I mean, Javier, it, it's a fairly good draw so far as, look, you're an 80-card deck and you drew two copies of Merge and Ultimatum, but your cards didn't come the way that you wanted them to in this particular game, and Martin certainly has. So he's going to resolve, it looks like, an Epiphany and now a Cure, Best of Sea God, so another turn coming. Now, I'm taking a look here. Let's see. No good attack there. Gargaroth's not bad. And I think the thing that's important here for Martin, actually, as he's going to attack here for a bunch of damage, is these counter spells that he's actually got in the holster to defend himself. Because it's right. not game over with the attacks just yet, but it's the fact that Martin does have like a little bit of removal and Heartless Axe, a little bit of counter magic and Disdainful Stroke and Jawari Disruption. That's going to get him over the finish line, I think. Yeah, no doubt about it. He can even have a little room to play another spell if he'd like here, but there's no realistic scenario. You know, if Javier has his own copy of Gargaroth, he's got the answer in the act. If Javier, you know, plays a land and tries to play some big spell, well, he can counter that with Disdainful Stroke or even with a Drawry Disruption, potentially. I think Martin just has his bases covered here. Remember, the Yorian's not going to untap either, so that's not even a consideration uh, for this next turn, he doesn't even necessarily need to use his Heartless Act there. So, and and just to add insult to injury, by the way, tapped both of the uh, Omen of the Sea. That is just <laughs> an unkind thing there from Mr. Martin Yuza. Just flexing on him. Yeah, really. Okay, land here for Dominguez. Is there anything that he can do? He's going to try. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the hope of okay. If you don't have a counter spell, I'm I'm good to go. The problem is, is that we're not event. good to go. Yeah, he yeah. could he could he could extinction event resolve it on evens and life is good, right? You get rid of all that nonsense. But the reality is, is that Martin actually does have a counter spell here and a key one in disdainful stroke. That's right. He's got the disdainful stroke, so he had the hard counter for really anything relevant at this point. Dominguez considered going for the Wolf Willow Haven first but decided, eh, I can play around like two Jwari Disruption or something by just putting this spell in the stack. And if it resolves, we actually have a game. But as we knew, it was never going to resolve. And in nope. fact, it did not. So that is game number one going to Martin Yuza as he gets off to the uh, to the good start there. Now the players get to consult their sideboards. Um, how much different is the matchup post-board? Well, it becomes pretty different so far as players have a lot of disruption now, right? They've got proactive disruption and discard like duress, where you see Javier has four, Martin has three. They've got reactive permission. Already has some counter spells in the main deck, but bringing some more in, both have an additional copy of Disdainful Stroke. You can make an argument for Test of Talents. You see for Martin Cyborg, he's got another copy of Negate and Mystical Dispute. But the big one here is Coma, Cosmo Serpent, where Martin has three, Javier has two. Uh, this card can win games all by itself, whether you're cheating it onto the battlefield very quickly as something like a Luka, or if you're actually just paying the seven mana for it to get it onto the battlefield. It's incredibly, incredibly, incredibly powerful. Martin has a bit of an advantage here insofar as he has three where Javier has two, but you know, re realistically, you, you resolve this thing, you get onto the battlefield, it's not going to take long to win the match. So that's a key card around this matchup, which can't be countered and is incredibly difficult to kill. A lot of games come down to coma. It does. Just going on the stack, and it's like, well, all right, I guess we're done here. The uh, the duresses will also be important. I think it's interesting to note how game one went, where if duress had been part of the mix for either player, it would have played out completely differently than it did. You know, if... Javier had had a, a single duress in his draw at any point there. He could have, you know, potentially dealt with the ultimatum that ultimately won the game. And, you know, on the other side, Martin Yuza, he had to play kind of the dance where he's like, well, does this resolve? Or what if I put this on the stack? Or, you know, he played a Yorian with an extra mana with nothing even on the board 
you know, it's not really where you want to be. But if he had a duress, he would have known, oh, I can just I can just windmill whatever I want here. And we will see, you know, between seven copies between the two, we'll, we'll be seeing duresses here in the in the next game. Yeah, duress is a huge card in this matchup. It can't go understated, as you've mentioned, because not only is the effect something that you definitely want access to, to be able to get that information by looking at your opponent's hand, to be able the ability to actually select a non-creature spell from the opponent's hand and make them lose that, but also the fact that it's so cheap, just a single black mana. If that effect were to cost three mana, you're probably less interested. But the fact that it costs one allows you to start your turn off with that and maybe lead into something else by clearing the way or saying, you know what, actually, your hand, I'm not going to cast this spell I was thinking about casting. There's a lot of positives to duress in this particular matchup, especially after sideboard, should play a pretty key role in things. Taking a look at the wow. opening hand here, and we see that uh, Martin, unfortunately, has gone down to five here, and this is going to get tough. Well, the, the, one of the things I do enjoy about Martin and myself, not afraid to take a mulligan, not scared, even a little, not my favorite thing to do. I doubt it's Martin's favorite thing to do, but not afraid to do it. Yeah, that that is definitely a strain. I've, I've watched your stream before and you are very, you, you know what's up. You're just like, nope, this is a mulligan. I know this is a mulligan and I don't want to, but you don't waste any time, you know, complaining about it. And Martin's the same way. The London mulligan. It's just, it's a gift. It allows us to just send it back and not feel bad about things. It really does kind of soften the blow. Yeah. <laughs> it does. And, you know, and I, I think that's been one of the one of the great changes to the rules wow. in the game uh, over the last few years, for sure. If you've been playing Magic as long as you and I have been, and, and most of the players in the MPL and Rivals, you remember some of the older Mulligan rules, um, where it was just kind of like, ah, well, I just guess I just don't get to play. And then, like, Pure the pain. Yeah, when the Vancouver Mulligan rule came along, and it's like, oh, baby, scry? I get yeah. this scry? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, and, now, and now this new one, uh, here the London Mulligan rule, as it is uh, as it is known, uh, boy, is it nice for uh, players and playing for 20-plus years like, like most of us have been. Yeah, that's right. So Martin making a game out of it here. He's resolved a pair of Wolf Willow Havens and, is, and has a land drop to give here as well. We could see... Um, Elder Gargaroth come down next turn and, uh, and you know, that's the type of card that if it survives for a turn or two, that can get you right back into business. And Javier Dominguez, well, he does have the answer. He has a disdainful stroke in hand as we see him foretell an Alrun's epiphany from his hand. Yeah, Javier just has that stroke available, as you mentioned, can take care of Gargaroth, can take care of Binding the Old Gods if and when it does show up. Martin, it, the, the one thing that is kind of nice on this Mulligan to five, I mean, it's not great, obviously, but he does have a backup threat there in Urien, uh, of course, hiding out in the companion zone. So this Gargaroth, well, we'll see if, if, if this is going to resolve. Almost certainly not, and it won't from the disdainful stroke. But there's at least another threat coming here for Martin over the course of, uh, it looks like, two turns. Yeah, th that's one of those situations where Martin kind of understands that it's really unlikely he ever gets to to enter combat with the Gargaroth. Like it either is going to eat a removal spell or a counter spell when Javier has six cards in hand. We see Yorian onto a dry board here, though. Uh, for Dominguez, this seems to be the play here while the, the shields are down. And, uh, you know, Javier says, well, stroke, you know, if if, if you happen to have... Uh, a dispute, fine, but otherwise I'm just going to get my Yorian onto the battlefield, no Val. Yeah, uh, I mean, that's just... probably going to prompt uh, Martin to fire off Binding here. Yeah, I, mean, I, I like the idea here from Javier, which is, yeah, I'm not going to overvalue this card. Does it have a higher ceiling? Yeah, of course. There's omens in the deck and a bunch of other things that you can link to make this a much more powerful card, but at the end of the day, it's just kind of a free inclusion. So you can also just treat it as a, I don't know, just a five mana, four or five flyer that, you know, if your hand's kind of weak, especially when you mulligan to five, we can get this party started, but it's going to die. Yeah, and, and that is a, a heads-up play there from Javier, because as you pointed out there, Cedric, when you are on five, you don't get to answer everything, right? Like, you're going to run out of answers, and a four or five actually is a very reasonable clock. We've seen Yorian take huge chunks of life total out in matchups like this when it was kind of the last thing left over. Here's Alrun's Epiphany, but out of gas is Martin Yuza. He's staring down at a swamp. He has nothing going, and he just has to say, okay, you get to resolve it. Now, the good news for Martin is that Javier's not really maximizing on it, right? It was just kind of the thing he could do that turn. He gets a couple of birds and a land drop out of it. Still a good spell, but, you know, this isn't a game ender here from Martin's perspective. Significantly higher ceiling on that card as well in this deck. 
at the end of the day, six mana make two one ones take another turn. Not bad in this situation. It bridges you into Vorniclex now to be able to beat down here for eight points of damage. But as we've all seen, All Runs Epiphany has a very high ceiling in any deck that it's in. It was pretty honest this time, but given Martin's hand and now his ability to maybe bridge the gap a little bit here with his own All Runs Epiphany, we know it can do a lot better. Yeah, that that Vorinclex really really annoying here for use. It, it stops his binding from from going up, and he doesn't get the land out of the deal. It's just going to sit there on one for a while. And he did draw Alrun's Epiphany, as you mentioned, said so good. I mean, he gets to to cast something that's relevant here, but mm, he's going to need more than this. That Vorinclex is really a problem. Yeah, I mean, could be, could use an ultimatum right now. That's for sure. Removal spell uh-huh. Vorinclex. I mean, he does get another. He gets another look at it, right? One of the things that's nice about playing this deck is uh, LOL playing the land. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. I think Mark, I think Martin may have briefly been thinking about should I play this land or not when you do have access to Seagate Restoration in your deck. So that's a little bit humorous that that took place, but yeah. He did have a he did have a pretty high ceiling as far as draws were concerned in this spot that he just uh, he failed on. Well, he does get to use up all of his mana this turn by playing Yorian and then blinking his Omen as well as the Binding here. Mm. Hey, there's an Emergent Ultimatum. Now, of course, yep. uh, we, we should mention again that the Binding isn't going to do anything because of the Vorinclex. It is back on the battlefield. <laughs> That's a pretty really that's a really nice city restoration. You're seeing Martin's reaction to the duress. It's like we set it up perfect, partner. We talk about duress before the game. Duress shows up and is awesome because it's cheap and takes Martin's best card. We're Clean so living, good at this. Cedric. We're doing we are it. So good at this. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, and if you caught that head shake from Yuza, he's like, uh. I mean, he had it, right? And now he gets to resolve a Seagate Restoration, which isn't bad, but with just one other card, he's just going to get a card plus another off of the Restorations, uh, you know, kind of give you one for free ability. And, uh, and well, he did draw another one. So with his draw step, if he can fire off and actually resolve another one, he will have a pretty decently sized hand. What's going on in the hand here for Dominguez? Well, he has a Dwari Disruption, which uh, that's not going to be enough. Two, four, six, seven. He'll even have one left over. Uh, for for Yuza, so we could see things get interesting. The real question is, does Yuza want to go for the triple block on the uh, Vorinclex here? Yeah, I mean, you can't feel good about it if you're Martin Wright because your your opponent here in Javier has six cards in hand. You know, you're, are you are you really thinking this is going to work out, or do you feel like your hand is forced and it's like, okay, I don't really have much really much else I can do here. I just got to hope and hope and pray for the best, and hope oftentimes is not a strategy. So goodbye, Yurian. Yeah, the real issue with the Vorinclex is that it's just beating the heck out of Martin Yuza life, out of his life total right now. Like, yep. yeah, it's annoying that it, it kind of brick walled the binding the old gods, but it's also just smashing Martin. He's down to six right now. And that's why you saw him sort of shake his head and say, well, I have to take this risk, even though I'm I'm well aware that this is not likely to work out for me. The question here is, does he just have to play Pelucronos as a blocker? Because if he goes for Seagate Restoration, he basically has to find one of his two-mana removal spells to kill Vorinclex or the game's over. Yeah, and that's a, kind of the difficulty in a situation like this, which Martin is certainly thinking about right now. Give it an old think. Looks like he might be going to, well, he's thinking Restoration. Is he thinking maybe cycle Zagoth Triome? Maybe try to find a little something that way? I think he's trying to go restoration into Heartless Act and just <clears throat> and just kill the the Vorinclex and try to get his feet back on the ground here. Because I go. think he knows he can just play Pelucranos and have a blocker for the Vorinclex, but you know he could easily lose that next turn. Uh, you know it opens him up to a removal spell from Dominguez killing Martin. Well, oh, this is a big spin. Yep. Interestingly, I think the Jwari disruption all but locks it up here for Dominguez because look at yeah. that. He even found the Heartless Act. Talk about Heartless here. Dominguez, I think, is just going to crush his dreams. Yeah, and that's kind of the funny one here, right? We're, we're, pretty, we're pretty deep into this game, and you would think that, okay, well, Jwari disruption is not particularly relevant except for when it is. Boom. There's the Jwari disruption to even things up here. Javier Dominguez picks up game number two, and boy – I got to say the, the cheap interactive spells somehow super relevant down the stretch there, the duress and the Jwari disruption kind of took it home there for Dominguez, even though this was on turn, what, 10 or something like that. 
Yeah, Jawar Disruption, right? You know, part of the benefit of this card as opposed to a card like Force Spike or Mana Tide or some other effects like that is it's also a land. So you can convince yourself and get away with it insofar as, well, if it doesn't line up correctly, I can just put it on the battlefield as a land, helps me get closer to Ultimatum and the rest of my other expensive spells, so it's fine. And then there will be those rare circumstances where you get into the late game where, yeah, just pay one more. Oh, you can't? Okay, well, I guess I win. That's right. And that was another thing that was certainly going through Martin Hughes' mind as he tried to line up the, that last sequence, right? A really difficult spot for him uh, and a total judgment call. Do you go for the Seagate Restoration into the removal spell, which, of course, you have to get lucky to hit because if you don't draw the removal spell and, you know, this is a an 80-card deck, then, uh, well, then you lose, right? You're, you're just not going to win the game. Uh, on the spot, you're dead. But then you also have to dodge, dodge Dwari Disruption or any number of counter spells outside of Disdainful Stroke. But you get to draw a bunch of cards and set yourself up to potentially have a chance to actually win the game. Now, your other option is much safer, right? And that's you just play Pelucranos because Pelucranos can block and then you should be good to go. The problem with that is, is that, of course, if your opponent does have the removal spell, you lose on the spot. You're just done. And it's not a particularly mana efficient play because the next turn you draw your card and what are you going to do? Play Seagate Restoration, maybe have an extra spell and pass. Not a great position to be in either. Martin did what a lot of you'll see a lot of professional players do. He recognized how behind he was in that game and he went for the higher upside play, even if it was riskier, because he wanted to give himself not a chance to hang around in the game, a chance to win the game. Yep. And uh, as we saw, it didn't work out for him there. Big difference to be sure, but it, it makes a lot of sense when you do explain it the way that you just did. If, you know, not trying to, as you said, try to hang around, keep your head above water, but actually try to win the actual game because uh, in, in what we are playing in right now, that is the most important thing going on. Two really, really good cards to look at here with Omen of the Sea in Emergent Ultimatum and Coma. We talked about both of these cards kind of at length about how important each one of them are. But you do get yourself in this weird situation where you want these cards, you want to find them a little bit later. You don't want to find them right now, really. Boy. Yeah, that's tough because when, you know, assuming that your opponent doesn't do anything in, insane in the mid game, boy. You really want to have as many haymakers to throw because you you figure one's going to get duress, one's going to get countered. But if you don't have the lands to get there, then it, it's not worth it to keep them anyway. We saw a key Juari disruption there from Javier Dominguez nabbing a Cultivate and really kind of putting a stop sign here on Yuza in the early game. Yeah, that car, Juari Disruption, is kind of stealing the show here in these particular games that we're watching here between Dominguez and Martin Yuza of, yeah, that card's good sometimes, but countering... Countering the game game tightening removal spell, I'm not going to say game winning Heartless Act, but going to tighten the game back up a little bit last game, and now countering a key cultivate when you see how expensive Martin's hand is, Desire Disruption has never looked so good. All right, first threat to stick on the battlefield comes from Javier Dominguez. He's got Pelucranos Unchained sitting there as a big 6-6 six, six, ready to go. Martin had to spend his last turn paying for Yorian tax not a particularly effective turn, but it did set this up where he gets to cast a Yorian and get a card off of it thanks to Omen of the Sea. So incremental advantage here for Martin. Just getting a little value here. Maze Mind's Tome, not in love with it in this particular game state. Love it on turn two, turn three, not when you're facing down a 6-6. Six, six. So I can see putting that on the bottom, keeping the Wolf of Haven on top. You draw that card. You've got a land and Seagate Restoration as well. Um, so you just want to make sure that you kind of you're getting closer to your colors here for the emergent ultimatum. Coma colors look good. Looks like you might be shy of black mana here, Marshall, for emergent ultimatum. And now Awkward. there's a duress. And there's duress. That's right. So Javier Dominguez is going to take a look at the big stuff. This is another reason why coma is such an important card in the mirror. You cannot duress it, but. You've got Emergent Ultimatum and Seagate Restoration in hand here for Yuza, so two juicy targets. He also could aim lower and take Wolf Willow Haven if he views uh, mana development critical at this juncture. 
Man, I am I am eyeing up that Seagate restoration. Like I've got a problem. It's a land and a spell. Get that Look thing out of here. He went for the Wolf Willow Haven. Uh, okay. And now wow, the binding. That's aggressive. Okay. All right, so let's get a little race on here, right? Let's kill that creature. Let's bonk you for six. And let's get really moving here a little bit. Hmm. That's that could be a good draw too. That could be. Yeah, it's always really interesting when you see a counter spell top, come off the top of the library the turn after a player got to rest. As you can see. Javier knows five of the six cards in hand here for Yuza. The only one he doesn't know about is the most important one, Mystical Dispute. Although I will say that the only thing... Well, okay, if he goes for Yorian, he can actually get it. Yeah, so this is kind of interesting, right? Because Martin, I don't think as a player who bluffs very much, and it is a... I mean, it's a tough bluff to pay three life when you're staring down a 6-6 six, six and going, yeah, I drew Mystical Dispute. Trust me, I did. Now, the reality of the situation is that he actually has. So if the plan is I'm going to go for Urian and blink out the binding to kill your Elder Gargaroth and keep attacking you that way, you get blown up badly by Mystical Dispute. Really bad. And it's also really important to note that the untapped Seagate restoration there costs three life. And when your opponent has a 6-6 six, six on the board and you're at 14, you're giving up an entire turn of clock to their creature. It definitely makes the bluff more credible if it is a bluff or if you're Javier, it might make you think, yeah, probably not a bluff. All right, well, we're just going to battle this way then. Okay, it says, let's just fight this thing, get that off of the battlefield and just keep moseying along. So worth noting. Love this. This is some this is some really great stuff here between the two. Oh, are we gonna see Valky God of Lies? Yeah, we'll yeah. let's see what's going on in your hand because he knows about the Yorian, so it's a guaranteed hit, but it even does get big better, although it looks like a soul shatter is gonna take care of the Valky here. Let's see any responses. I mean, you could fight over it. That's an option, right? You can just say, okay, I'll negate that. I really want this Falky to resolve. I've got Dispute in the holster, too. Dispute covers Dispute covers me against a Merchant Ultimatum. Is this negate really going to get that much better? It's really tempting. Especially just the fact that, that Javier's doing this. It's like, ugh. And again, you have a Yorian sitting there no matter what. Now, turning your Valky into a Yorian's not amazing, right? You're basically just doubling its power. But little does uh, does Martin Yuzin know there's a much better target, and it's Coma Cosmo Serpent. Yeah, I'm going to take that take one. It here. Yeah. This could get interesting. And now, if you take a look at uh, if you take a look at Javier's hand before drawing that Bind the Old Gods, you know, what I would have said is his hand kind of stinks, but that was a timely removal spell. Because that should take care of Valky. You see, Martin. Martin is, Martin is being as agonizing right now over these draw steps. You just come on, let me catch a break one time. Yeah, because th th with how much information these players have with the duresses and the Valkies and stuff, you know when you got top decked. Like, yeah, <laughs> you don't have to go. I wonder if they had it and just played really great and kept it. Ah, uh, he got there. He got there the though, land. Marshall. So this he got there for coma. Okay, not quite for ultimatum yet. No, actually, no. That's that was the perfect one. That was the blue black pathway, I think. Oh, he needs another green then. Blue, blue, blue. Okay, so he's shorter green. Okay, so yeah. merge ultimatum he cannot do. Coma he can do. Yeah. So sorry, you have to settle for a coma after your opponent's on two creatures in hand. We could see the coma mirror here though. The board state could be littered with oh. serpent tokens. This is about to become quite the mess. It's rare. It's rare when we watch this deck because the mana is so good between the pathways, the triomes, the cultivates, the bindings, all this other stuff, right? For them not to be able to cast an emergent ultimatum on time when they get to seven mana, more often than not, they've got triple green, double black, double blue. This is one of those times where that's simply not the case. So missing a green source of mana is Martin. But right now, if you take a look at Javier's hand, Marshall, there's still no counter spell or discard spell to take the ultimatum from Martin's hand. So if Martin peels off that green source, clear for takeoff with the ultimatum. That's right. And I think if that happens, he's good to go, right? I mean, this is a very difficult spot. Once Martin has one of the serpents on the battlefield, he has the insurance plan against plays like this, and he should be in, a, in good shape to have a coma, just get to do coma things going forward. And, you know, as we've seen, this is why they're running seven copies of coma between the two of them out of the yep. board. It's just unstoppable once it gets rolling. 
It is an incredibly, incredibly powerful card once it gets rolling. The juice is very much worth a squeeze, but you're going to pay a lot for it. It's not like it's a cheap card. It's seven mana and color intensive. But once that snowball gets rolling downhill, it is very tough to stop. It's crazy because, you know, when you put this much pressure on your opponent with just the one permanent, you know, then we have to start looking at Martin being able to resolve Emergent Ultimatum and, and get out of it. You see Coma's going to activate the ability of the Serpent here to protect Coma, and this is why you see that look of despair on Javier Dominguez, Dominguez's face. He's in a terrible spot right now, and look at this. Double dispute now as well. Those are the two unknown cards to Javier Dominguez. Now, it wasn't the green source to just slam ultimatum and and maybe say GG here, which which Martin would have done. He also knows Javier's hand in this uh, particular spot. But now he can just sit here and on his two copies of Mystical Dispute. And the only real way for Javier to fight back is to play his own copy of Coma and make them board state muddled, I suppose. But boy, I don't want to be behind two serpents or three serpents to, to my opponent's coma. Yeah, and that's the thing that's worth mentioning that you that you did just mention, which is you're gonna be behind you're gonna be behind, excuse me, as far as the serpents are concerned. Uh and that's what makes it incredibly, incredibly difficult in a spot like this is yeah, having your own coma is pretty darn good, would never say otherwise, but right now you're behind on the serpent count. And is there any meaningful way for you to actually catch up? in this situation. That's what we're gonna have to find out over the next couple of turns. But while Javier has to think about that, maybe, you know, Pelucranos Unchained, coming back from the graveyard, all, all that other stuff, there's this thing looming over this game that he knows about, which is Martin has an emergent ultimatum in hand and is just missing a green source and is gonna get a draw step to look at, to find it or sacrifice Omen of the Sea to try to find it. So in some respects, if you're Javier, you just play the game like there is no green source coming because what can you do? Well, he found a pathway, but it's the blue-black one, so that's not going to give him the green mana that he needs. So he doesn't want that. The Wolf Willow Haven's attempting one because it actually does unlock another green source for him, but he wouldn't be able to cast the ultimatum, I don't think. Two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, not quite right. Two. Not in two. the traditional sense. Right. So he says, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bottom these and just try to peel a, a green source naturally. Well, let's see how we're running. It's nice to know early how you're running sometimes. Are we doing <laughs> good or are we doing bad? <laughs> That's a completely nonsensical way to think. It, no, it really is. But, but I do it. <laughs> we're, we're, me and you are on that track. It's I nice to know it. when, right? Like the momentum stuff. We're, we're all match, about it. Magic gods, how are we feeling? Right. Can I get a little, just a little check here before we yeah. start our, our match? That's how right. are we looking? Play a little pickup game with your friends. Okay, I'm good. I'll just keep every hand then. Be totally fine. Looks like we got a little stop in the upkeep here. Maybe there's some tapping to be done from either player. I have to make me sweat out the draw step. I hate that. <laughs> oh, Come on, baby. I just want to see that green roll off the top. I guess the consideration is if you're going to tap something, right? Oh, well... That's a thing you can resolve. Right. So this is interesting because it wasn't the green source for the ultimatum, but it might have just been better. He just draws Seagate Restoration clean off the top, which is it's not it's not as immediate as as emergent ultimatum, but it's on par with, you know, the amount of advantage he's gonna get in as far as uh, helping him win the game. And he gets to resolve it. He even found an uh, an untapped blue source. <clears throat> well, it looks like he may not keep up. His, so the uh, Ultimatum. So you and I are on the same page in so far as I think Martin was thinking to himself, do I want to cast a Seagate Restoration? Because if I do, and I don't find an untapped blue source, the shields are down, if Javier peels an emergent ultimatum. Right? Because now, but but if you but if you think about it the other way, Javier has so much land, he can pay for a mystical dispute. Right. So it doesn't matter. The mystical dispute now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve mana, thirteenth land in hand. That costs seven. So I, I believe, as long as my eyes are not deceiving me, that Javier could pay for double dispute in this situation because he has so much mana. So the disputes are actually kind of stinky. Yep, you are correct. And uh, they they have uh, outlived their time. Uh, they've overstayed their welcome. Yeah. 
It doesn't mean that there's not the potential for a double spell turn down the line here for Dominguez, but the truth of the matter is that from Martin Hughes' perspective, he's just ahead on the coma game right now, and that's giving him the the upper hand. Now, there is an interesting development here in that Yorion is attacking and will be attacking here as Martin's allowed that to happen. And, uh, you know, down to 11 is Martin Yuza. He has to consider his life total here as this is really the only relevant thing left. Looks like Coma might be feeling it too. Mm-hmm. Coma might be saying, it's time. It's my time to shine. I'm assuming that Martin is just trying to set up for a win, basically, by by waiting. Like they'll basically just trade Serpents here. But, you know, if Martin uh, wants to, he can wait for the Shields to be down enough here from Javier he can, you know, freeze up a couple of permanents on the other side and then just swing for a lethal hit. Both players think they're going to sacrifice servants predictably to make their comas indestructible. That's right. Down to seven falls Martin, but that's two more hits with Yorian, and that's not going to happen. No, I don't I don't think it's gonna. I do not think it's gonna. Interestingly, we do see a huge Pelucranos hit the battlefield here. It's a 12-12 off of escape. And maybe just possibly there's some world where Javier can punch coma enough times to uh to whittle down the serpents on the other side. I mean Oh, and look at this, a clever play here from Dominguez. He's going to tap a green source here from Yuza on his upkeep, knowing that with only one green source on the battlefield, there's no way that he can fire off an emergent ultimatum. Although it's kind of funny because Martin has just found Curibus the Sea God now. He just keeps drawing, uh, you know, seven mana plays that he can actually cast. Yeah, and again, this is kind of the appeal to this strategy is because because you have so much mana in your deck and so many ways to find mana, you know, these these big payoff spells, they're not the best draws in the early game, but when you're getting a situation like this where we're in the late game, you're hoping to draw something really, really nice, you got some fun of one-ups in here that you can draw, and Kiora Best of Sea God is certainly one of those, so uh, not a bad card to resolve here if you're Martin. Yeah, it's funny because they all cost six, seven mana, something like that. They're really powerful game ending or at least game swinging spells in almost every scenario as we see exactly one of those hit the battlefield cure best the sea god comes down there's an eight eight and basically if martin can survive another turn here he should be good to go once the tap happens he'll have a big lethal attack and we see javier start to go to work on the uh, serpents here he's going to churn through a couple of them martin's just going to let the fight happen of course he could sacrifice in response the downside of that is that the counters would then stay on pelucranos and martin decides you know it's not changing anything anyway so i'm just going to go ahead and let those counters go away down to uh, pelucranos goes down to a six six here on javier's turn is there a way out here for dominguez he's been behind the eight ball here as he was the second player to resolve his coma Cosmo Serpent, and that's put him at a pretty big disadvantage for the last three, four turns. Yeah, um, it is. It, it's you don't have to you don't have to be that far ahead with Coma to keep that advantage. You know, a turn or two, and then you're just always going to be ahead of your opponent unless something kind of weird happens. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what that weird thing would be. Uh, but Martin is pretty far ahead right now. I mean, seems ahead in almost every metric, ignoring life total. Does. I don't think really needs to concern himself, concern himself, excuse me, that much with the four or five flyer in Urian. So I, I like Martin's positioning here. This one does get, if you haven't been in this situation that often, and I certainly haven't been, it can get a little bit complicated just as far as the micro is concerned about how to, uh, for lack of a better term, cross the finish line. But right. I do think and, that he's ahead. Yeah. And, you know, Martin, he had a, an interesting situation here with the Pelucranos and stuff, but that cure best to see God that is kind of easy mode, right? For, <laughs> hey, how do I finish this game? And it's just like, how about tap all non-land permanence target opponent controls? <laughs> nah, that's not bad. <laughs> how does that that's feel, <laughs> right? It's like, okay, I guess I'll do that. And then all of a sudden, you know, the C's part in front of you and you can just slam in for, for a potential uh, victory here. And you can see Javier is really struggling to try to sort out if there's any possible way for, to survive or to punch through for any of that last damage. It feels like he's closer than it looks thanks to the Pelucranos, but just not quite there. Yeah. 
Thank you, Mr. Seagod. Those chapters, they all add up. They all very much matter. Now, here comes the four or five flyer once again, but uh, seven is not four last I checked, so Martin's going to fall down to what I would say is a rather healthy three, given the situation. Does seem to be the case, yeah. Uh, you know, Martin declining to use his coma in a more defensive manner because he has the Curibus of Seagod at the ready, and uh, and that's going to trigger here, and boom, the entire team gets tapped, and especially with a duress in hand, he also has disdainful stroke. There just really can't be much that can go wrong here from Yuzu's perspective, right? I'm Let's trying. To, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of something that can go wrong. Yeah, I think what's going to happen is is we're going to see fight, fight, and then he can still coma, right? Yeah, he can still yeah. use coma. It doesn't require any tapping. That should keep Javier alive, but I think that just means he doesn't lose this particular turn. I think I think this is what this means is he doesn't lose this turn, but he, but he probably loses the next turn. And before, because Javier has so much mana, he could work himself through double dispute. The thing that he cannot work himself through is sustainable stroke. So Coma's going to get tapped down, but this does get kind of interesting because if Martin lets that happen, the activated abilities can't be activated this turn of Coma. So just in case Martin wanted to sacrifice any of the serpents left over, that's what he'd have to do. But as you can see, he has lethal here, so he's like, okay. Yeah, how's uh, 14, which is close. Yeah, so I suppose that if there's enough mana, Pelucranos can punch one of these serpents. That's my assumption. That means that it's 11, but everything's staying tapped. So how mm -hmm. in the heck is Javier supposed to get this last three in? Yeah, bef before Martin drew the sample stroke, I would say peel an ultimatum. Um, right. Now, I'm not so sure because I'm just trying to think of like, what's the awesome, powerful spell that you can draw right now to get yourself out of the situation? I like it. Disrupt them real good. I like yeah. that. Taste I like it, that. Martin. That's right. <laughs> Love that sound. Um, and I don't think there is one now. I just right, Disdainful Stroke really covering the bases here. Bold, like paying for it. Check it out. Forest, cool. And this is the, I might as well, ult uh, sorry, <laughs> cultivate here from uh, from Martin. Yeah, just make sure just make sure you got plenty of blue up for disputes and strokes. And again, I think I think stroke is the check mark on this particular game. Does seem to be the case. Coma makes things weird, right? But I feel Always like does. Martin has the ability to like uh, you know, freeze up the opposing coma and sort of force the issue. Disdainful stroke off the top for Javier is not gonna get the job done. He can make a wolf with Wolf Willow Haven. Of course, it's only on his turn that he can do that. So he gets a 3-3 and a 2-2, but Martin's going to be at full force here once again. And let's not forget, there is an ultimatum there as well. Just chilling. Yeah. Oh, I get to take a little something. Yeah, hmm. What would you like? What I do? Okay, yeah, I sure. think you just take the coma, right? I mean, you only get to keep one of them, but it effectively kills it. And... Yeah. Wow, this is a great game from Yuzu's perspective. He had to really scrap this one out. I mean, we cannot underestimate, and um, I mean, I can't think of the right word now because words are hard. But <laughs> even though I talk for a living, words are hard. Words are uh, really hard. <laughs> yeah, Mar Martin is good. How's that? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Martin good. is good at magic. Uh, Martin, Martin's ability to scrap and claw back through these league weekends after that disaster of a weekend with Mono Red. If he would have just been like, you know what, I'm off it. I, I get it. I get yep. it. Like, it just kind of phoning it in, giving up, so much frustration, whatever. For him to just continuously battle in the way that he has over the past couple of weeks and months and everything else through all the frustrations that he's been through, league weekends and competitive magic in some respects, I mean, I love it. I love it because he, he's... He's he's digging in, man. He's grinding his way through this. Can he catch Seth? Almost certainly not, but can he get that other spot? Oh yeah. It's it's actually starting to come into view here for Yuza. I mean, he needs things to go right on his end and go badly for for the top spots there. But like the fact that he's even in this, to me, it's it's a highlight of the format that they've chosen here with the seven league weekends. 
Um, and there we go. That is the finally the victory there going to Martin Yuza. You know, we don't normally have this type of opportunity, Cedric, where if you do poorly, really at any point during a high level magic tournament, you are then out of that tournament, right? Yeah. You, you do not get to play anymore. And what that means is that these players aren't necessarily accustomed to this. Martin had to go through a grueling weekend. Really, that's probably the worst weekend for anybody, you know, at the at the highest levels. Because again, every other situation where that happens, you're out to dinner with friends, right? Just you're wipe done. your hands. Just wipe yeah, your hands of it. Hey, wasn't my weekend? I'll come back next weekend. You don't have to sit there and go am I really going to lose nine in a row? Because if you already lost five, you're out, right? So, you know, and and then we have to come back, you know, on a further weekend and do this again. Yep. And it shows, you know, that perseverance in this format, this, this, uh, the way that we did these tournaments really was key as we see Martin scrapping his way back, at least onto the radar. And another W uh, yeah. against one of the best active players and one of the best competitive and professional level players that we've ever seen here in Javier Dominguez. So we can't undersell that either. So all in all, excuse me as I wipe those eyes, all in all, unbelievable display here for Martin early on here too. There's a lot of magic left to be played over the course of these two days. Each match is just going to get progressively more difficult, I presume, especially, you know, as, as more and more is on the line, you're going to put some pressure on yourself. Um, for what you're trying to accomplish here if you're Martin, um, because there is a lot on the line here with the MPL and Worlds and everything else, all things that he's accomplished before and he wants to accomplish again. So a really, really nice win there for him. And uh, fortunately for us, more magic to come. That's right. We've got more magic lined up for you. But first, we're going to take a short break. We'll be back right with more right after this.
and welcome back to coverage here of the final league weekend. This is our seventh league weekend, and this is the one that's going to put everybody into the spot that they're going to be either in world slash MPL slash rivals or into the gauntlets. So this is a huge weekend for our players as a seven week journey comes to its culmination. We've got another match to bring you. We're going to actually be watching uh, game number three between our two players. Riku Kumagai is our first one. Riku's playing Cycling, which is a deck that has really made a resurgence this weekend. Uh, Cedric, we've seen it 25% of the field. 25% rivals, which is, uh, I mean, really yeah. surprising to me, I, I, I must say. Not that I think the deck is good or bad, or uh, good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't show up in this this level, this amount, very often. Uh, and it's the kind of deck where, again, if people aren't ready for it, if people have not prepared for it, it's extremely, extremely good. But if you decide to focus your efforts on beating it, I, I don't think it holds up very well. Plenty of players are betting that people are not prepared for it, and that might work out pretty well for the 25% of players who have taken that gamble. Riku Kumagai among them. At the end of the day, for those of you that are new to Standard or not, we know what this deck is doing. Flourishing Fox, um, Zenith Flare, and a whole lot of cycling alongside Improbable Alliance. Yeah, Improbable Alliance, kind of the card that the older versions of the deck didn't run, or if they did, it wasn't very many, and has now seemed to become an absolute staple of 4X here for uh, Kumagai. On the other side of the table, it's Gregor's Kowalski, and Gregor's is playing a more traditional build here. He's got himself some Sultai Ultimatum. Powerful, consistent, very, very attractive, especially when you have a seven mana game winning spell. Yeah, that seven mana game winning spell can be a little bit difficult to cast sometimes, as we just saw in our last match. But as we also saw in our last match in the hands of Martin Yuza, sometimes you can win anyway without being able to cast it. So that's also what makes this deck incredibly, incredibly appealing. I wonder, seems like a tough matchup for Ultimatum, right? I like that's they get that's a version box, like <laughs> it's gonna be tough. Yeah, I mean, because there's not a ton of spot removal, I mean, you take a look at the main deck here, well, you, you see an Eliminate, um, you see four copies of Heartless Act, sure. Um, but, you know, realistically, it, it is kind of tough, I think, for them to be able to overcome this because they're playing what I would say is a lot more counter magic to be able to uh, interact in the mirror and maybe some interesting bullets for the mirror, like a Vorn and Klex, like multiple copies of Pelugranos, like cards like Elder Gargaroth, which are not great cards against the cycling deck. So geared more towards maybe Nye Adventures, other adventure strategies, uh, and the mirror, and less so uh, against cycling. So here we are. There we go. Let's take a look at the matchup here. Uh, both of our players coming in. Uh, 43 points apiece for them. And, uh, you know, that means that they're kind of on that next cusp of really needing a lot to go right, but not out of it just yet. And, uh, as, and as I mentioned before, we're going to come in for game number three between these two players as they're uh, finishing up their, their sideboard tweaks and all that kind of stuff. Looks like on ah. Riku's side, some counter magic coming in in Mystical Dispute, Disdainful Stroke, and Negate, so able to interact in that way. Other side of things there for Kowalski, duresses, eliminates, just more removal uh, and test of talents coming in as well. So um, looks like both players get some meaningful additions to their deck for this third and final game, all of which is, uh, well, and we're going to be saying this all weekend long, an important one. But for this particular weekend, it really feels like they all are. Yeah, it really does. But I mean, <laughs> a game three in any match is going to be big. And that's what we've got right now. So let's get underway here. We see duress, pos, pos, actually a really nice opener here for, for Gregor's. He's got the cultivate on top of his library here off of the scry. And he has duress, which is, you know, a great way to protect yourself from the most powerful card, the reason to play the deck the Zenith Flare, but he okay. also has the removal spell for the turn one Fox, because that's one of the big strengths of what Kuma guys brought to the table is that he can pressure you with a, a flourishing Fox that can really get out of hand quickly and kill you on its own and kind of make you react to two different types of threats. And uh, as it turns out, Kowalski has answers to both. Now, the one thing he's missing, a little bit of gasoline here, doesn't have much else going on. Yeah, I just need that payoff card, whatever that payoff card's going to be. You could say that it is the companion that's hanging out over there. I don't think that's going to be good enough to get the job done on its own, especially when you see a player that does have Mystical Dispute in hand. But Bingo. speak of the devil, <laughs> the namesake has shown up. That's right. So Emergent Ultimatum is going to hit, and that's going to allow uh, Gregor's to pay the tax for Yorian. And then if he'd like, he can keep up Jwari Disruption. I, I don't know how relevant it is in the matchup. It seems 
that it wouldn't be super important, but uh, eh, he's got one. Let's get our cycle on. Well, and we see kind of right Kuma guy just doing the cycling thing. Not a lot to see here, folks. Yeah, what's interesting here though is that because Kuma guy's hand is so reactive with a couple of different counter spells in hand, you do get yourself in a spot where I don't know. You get the opportunity if you're Kowalski to maybe try to draw out of this. You know, your your first threat or your second threat might be countered because Kuma guy is not putting any pressure on you realistically at this stage of things. He might find some time to actually um, find another threat if you're Gregor. So we'll see how the game does kind of unfold here. A little bit of a weird one after sideboard where uh, Kuma guy is bringing a lot of counter magic to the games. And then for Kowalski, he's bringing a mishmash of kind of everything to the game. Yeah, you know, having found that ultimatum gives him a clean path to a victory or at least a, a good chance of a victory if he can get there. But it is interesting to note that Kumagai, you mentioned he's he's got a few, you know, he's got two copies of Disdainful Stroke. And it's kind of interesting because he's going to be happy he has the backup copy because one's going to get duressed away potentially. And he really needs that other copy to take care of this ultimatum. I don't mind getting things started this way with an improbable alliance. That's some pressure, right? Mm -hmm. that that's a way for Kumagai to start uh, applying some type of pressure to Kowalski. Now, it's not fast, right? That isn't the type of card that's going to be in two turns. Well, you know, he just couldn't deal with the improbable alliance, but it does <laughs> yeah. matter. Like, that card is relevant here, and we're going to see it have an impact on the board, no doubt about it. Are we thinking maybe duress now? No, we're still hanging out. No duress to lead off with just yet. Because I, I think the plan here for Kowalski is something I talked about in the last match is you can clear the path with duress, right? It's so cheap. It gives you so much information. I get to look at your hand. I get to take a card, figure out what the heck you've got going on here. So if you start with duress in the ultimatum or duress into the big bird, you can try to go about winning things that way. But if you are uh, if you're Kowalski, you are not going to like what you see over here because there's a lot of counter magic there in Kumagai's hand. Like a That's lot. right. And I, in fact, I wonder if he ends up just taking the Zenith Flare instead. Like, is Maybe. he ever, I mean, he has to work his way through the counters, but that's going to be very difficult given what Kumagai happens to have. Now, the fact that Kowalski is aware of these cards helps him a little bit, but like with Disdainful Stroke, it's like you can know you, the opponent has it. It doesn't help you play around it. Nope. Just going to be sitting there. And yeah, I, that's a tough one. Kowalski says, wow, that is a nice hand, my friend. I did not expect to see that. If I'm Riku Kumagai, I show that hand confidently. Here it is, bud. I'm feeling pretty good about things. I don't have the fastest clock in the world, but as far as the contents of my hand, I'm feeling pretty darn good about things. It looked like Zenith Flirt is the selection, Marshall, uh, as you'd predicted, Funny. which I think makes the most sense. You can't poke a hole in the counter magic. So and now... He's gonna yeah, try to take away that threat. And what that should do, right, is buy Kowalski time. Because I think he figures, if I get enough time, I can start to overwhelm these counter spells. But if you have a Zenith Flare, and then say you draw another one, the game could just end, right? It could just be like, end step, my turn, you're dead. Yeah. And now, you know, it's really all about improbable uh, alliance here for Kumagai, which is a much, much slower clock. We've also gotten ourselves to the situation, potentially, as it looks like a memory leak is going to be cycled, where it's just kind of like, all right, I'm just going to jam the threats. I got to work through this wall of counter magic. So, all right, jam, cash your in, cast merge and ultimatum. Hope I draw another threat. And, and another disdainful stroke has been drawn out. So it's four. Is it literally, it's four counter spells? Wow. Kind of funny because the improbable alliance doesn't do a whole lot if you've got. <laughs> if you've got three disdainful strokes and a, and a mystical dispute in your hand, that's really weak. It's like not doing anything. I mean, it does have an activated ability that could become relevant, but I mean, if that's what you're doing with your turn, that can be a little rough. All right, well, you play the big bird this way because this forces Disdainful Stroke, right? Mystical Dispute can't really do anything to that. So, all right, I'm through one Disdainful Stroke. And if you're a Kowalski, you're like, all right, one more to go. One down, one to go. <laughs> yeah, now the reality is two more to go and two more disputes to go. But, you know, baby steps as it were. <laughs> That's right. I'm 
Merchant Ultimatum in hand for Kowalski, just dying to go on the stack, but that's not going to happen for quite a while. As we see Luris come down, now are we going to see uh, Kumagai take a different tact here where now he's going to start building out his board and applying pressure that way? Looks like it. And if you take a look at the hand here for Kowalski, this is big problem. Like, Flourishing Fox is only a 1-1, one -one, and, you know, right now Kumagai's not doing any cycling. But that thing can get out of hand with just a couple of cyclers off the top, and it looks like Kowalski's just going to have to just run out Emergent Ultimatum into a known disdainful stroke. Yep, got to try it. I mean, you're playing, you, you've played around dispute. you got your mana up, right? So you've checked that box. So it's like, okay, I've gotten through the second disdainful stroke. All right, next big spell I draw. Maybe that one's going to be good to go. So he's going to play the Dwari Disruption as a land, but he'll be able to cycle the Zagoth Triumph here. Show the cycling deck who's boss. <laughs> An interesting decision point here for Kumagai. To Kumagai's cycle gonna, or not. Yeah, Kumagai's going to want to do this weird thing now, this game where it's, okay, I just want to shorten the game as much as I can. You know, like like my hand's great. But I want to get the game over, too. So anything I can do to shorten it is going to be great. Let's see what this cycle here off the Triome is. Better hope it's not Extinction what? Event. Oh, wow. Carevec, though, is really nice here. So that thing, that thing costs four? Yeah. So that's I think it's, it's a must stroke. Wow. Like, it, unless he can get the Flourishing Foxes to two twos. But you do have a cycling card in hand. He, he just has to do it in response. So the Carevec actually not a must counter here it, it has it does awesome. a good job against improbable alliance tokens yeah and i guess it's a blocker for luris but that's not really a game ender he may just let it go yeah that's interesting he might right. just cast it and have it get countered and then it's like okay now i gotta work through disputes which okay but also time is not on kowalski's side anymore because a couple of turns ago the clock was just improbable alliance now there's two foxes there's luris there's really to cycle to make the foxes larger so now you actually got to be a little bit more risque with how you want to play this game, I think. And Kowalski's got to be feeling the heat here in game number three. He is facing down quite a board state, and Kumagai has the ability to protect it. it looks like we're going to keep eliminate. Got to get that Luris off the board, right? Yeah. This is a pain, too, because I think once you get through two strokes, you're like, okay, this is probably good, right? And it's like, nah, nah, it's not good. I got the third stroke. I am curious, though, if Kumagai is going to counter. He doesn't have to. It's true. It's really true. It doesn't have to be counter. I mean, Fox can Fox can it's, outpace these. He could, at the very least, he could start by cycling, right? Get some information. Right. See what my next card is. Okay, it's just a land. Yeah, it only kills one creature currently. It does reduce the others a little bit, but I mean, not in a meaningful way. Still, I think this is what you just described said. This is Riku saying, I want to slam the door on this game. Yeah. That's what it feels like to me is I just want to get this game over with. Now this eliminate, what do we want to go after? I mean, my assumption is Luris because killing a fox is doesn't really do anything, right? You kill a fox, it just comes back. So you probably like, have you're to gonna kill lose to two flourishing foxes. Like, I mean, not that, not that killing one really helps, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, Gregor's probably just needs to kill Luris here and he's going to have to find a sweeper or an ultimatum or something. And I, with the double mystical dispute here for Kumagai, it could be very difficult to resolve much of anything. Well, access to 11 mana is kind of nice. Well, there's a mm -hmm. second. I mean, this game could end right now, right? We could just That's have a right. cycle party. That's find right. Zenith flare, whatever. Exactly. We've seen these turns now post board. It's less likely, go. but there it is. Another cycler off the top. So that's an attack for three, six, seven. You can make it eight, nine. I mean, you could, you could, you could get all the way home. You really yeah, could. Looks like Kuma guy's going to leave up hard cast both of his mystical disputes available, and okay. he probably figures that'll lock it up that's rather than take action. the risk on on cycling. Yeah, I'm hoping to try to get all the way there. And right, because if you fall like even one point short, but leave yourself without one of your mystical disputes, that could be a disaster. Looks like he's going to keep all runs of Piffney. Might be thinking that the... Uh, Should just be GG, right? 
Yeah, I mean, this should get countered. I think the rationale be, to be I think the rationale behind leaving all runs epiphany on top here is the two bozos will block. You've got one dispute. I don't know your other cards, so this should resolve because I can pay a dispute. Right. And then I've got two, I get a, I get another draw step. I've got two blockers for your flourishing foxes. And I just get to keep playing. But the reality of the situation is that's a that's not what's going to happen. No, a great play there from Kuma guy. He recognized that he could win the game by effectively locking out Kowalski with double mystical dispute, and that's exactly what happens. Riku Kuma guy with his cycling deck is going to pick up the victory here, improve to forty four points, and keep his name in the conversation.